following the dramatic Starship Flight 9, which achieved key technical milestones despite not completing the mission, SpaceX has begun a detailed post-flight investigation with the FAA to determine the causes of the anomalies. This video breaks down developments after Flight 9, ongoing investigation directions, and new evidence explaining what went wrong. If you haven't yet, I recommend watching my previous video where I provided a detailed breakdown of Flight 9's events, as this builds on that analysis. Shortly after Flight 9, the FAA mandated a mishap investigation focused solely on the Starship upper stage's failure during ascent and re-entry. Notably, the Super Heavy Booster loss wasn't classified as a mishap because it fell under SpaceX's pre-approved test-induced damage exemptions. SpaceX intentionally pushed the booster into demanding conditions, including a steep re-entry angle to increase drag for fuel savings and landing precision, and planned to test engine out scenarios for system resilience. Because these maneuvers carried a high risk of failure, the booster's loss was not considered unexpected and didn't trigger a formal mishap response. Now, let's dive into the booster anomaly. Thanks to high-resolution footage from the YouTube channel What About It, we now have a much clearer picture of what actually happened during the landing attempt. The official SpaceX webcast showed 12 of the 13 central engines reigniting for landing, but roughly two seconds later, all engines shut down abruptly. The visuals were obscured at that moment due to poor visibility, making it impossible to determine the cause from the official feed alone. When compared with the footage captured by What About It? It becomes evident that an explosion engulfed the engine bay shortly after ignition, which appears to be the root cause of the engine shutdown. A plausible explanation is that the engines suffered structural damage prior to ignition, likely in the nozzles or surrounding plumbing, due to the intense aerodynamic and thermal loads experienced during re-entry at a steep angle of attack. This flight profile may have exposed the base of the booster to higher than anticipated dynamic pressure and heating, potentially damaging critical components. Such damage could lead to a hard start, combustion instability, or a propellant leak, all of which are capable of causing an explosion like the one observed. Supporting this theory is physical evidence recovered days after launch. Debris, mostly helium COPVs used to store high-pressure helium for engine spin starts, washed ashore. These lightweight, buoyant tanks from the aft booster section appeared first, implying the aft exploded and scattered them, while the heavier upper structure likely sank intact. Though the landing failed, the re-entry data will be vital for improving booster design, especially reinforcing the engine section to withstand extreme thermal and aerodynamic stresses during steep re-entry. Turning to the Starship upper stage, the situation is a bit more complex. According to SpaceX, the anomaly was caused by a loss of attitude control mid-flight triggered by a propellant leak. This loss of attitude control prevented the vehicle from maintaining proper orientation during re-entry, which is critical for aligning the heat-shielded belly toward the oncoming atmospheric flow. As a result, unprotected areas were exposed to intense thermal loads, leading to structural failure and ultimately causing the vehicle to break apart in mid-air. Telemetry was lost shortly before the ship could reach the ocean. Interestingly, a SpaceX employee later mentioned in a Discord chat that partial control was briefly regained moments before signal loss. This is consistent with what we saw in the webcast. After the initial loss of attitude control, the ship was relatively stable during the final moments with its heat shield tiles facing the direction of travel. However, moments later, the vehicle unexpectedly rotated nose down, plunging deeper into the atmosphere at an incorrect angle. This exposed unshielded areas to extreme thermal loads, causing the vehicle to break apart. An investigation is ongoing to determine the root cause of the propellant leak that led to this loss of attitude control. SpaceX is expected to release more details on the anomaly and any design improvements on their official website ahead of Flight 10. Following Flight 9, SpaceX has already begun routine inspections and repair operations at the launch site to prepare for Flight 10. As expected, some components at the pad took damage, but this time, the booster quick disconnect appears to have sustained more significant wear than usual, likely due to an early pitch over maneuver that directed the exhaust plume onto the BQD hood. The heat partially melted and bent back the steel door, possibly damaging internal plumbing and wiring. Although the full extent remains unclear, the door will likely need replacement, and internal repairs are expected to begin shortly. SpaceX's rapid response team is expected to have the pad ready soon for Flight 10 prelaunch tests, static fires, and ultimately, the launch itself. On the vehicle side, Ship 36, the upper stage assigned to Flight 10, is currently undergoing vehicle integration procedures. It recently received its aft flaps, finalizing its aerodynamic structure. 
Engine installation is also underway, after which the vehicle will proceed to static fire testing. This will both validate engine performance and test fixes for the propellant leak from Flight 9, as well as system anomalies from Flights 7 and 8. One unresolved issue is a thermal hotspot on a vacuum raptor, observed during Flights 8 and 9. In Flight 9, it emerged late in the ascent burn and didn't impact performance, but had it appeared earlier, it could have led to an engine failure and potential explosion similar to Flight 8. This suggests that while the mitigation measures were partially effective, they didn't completely eliminate the issue. SpaceX will use the static fire test of Ship 36 as an opportunity to further diagnose and address this recurring anomaly, ensuring it doesn't evolve into a mission risk in future flights. As for the booster for Flight 10, SpaceX has not yet confirmed whether it will fly a new Super Heavy or reuse Booster 15 from Flight 8. The final decision will likely depend on inspection results, Flight 10 mission objectives, and turnaround timelines. While Flight 10 is being prepped, Flight 11 development is already in motion in parallel. Ship 37, assigned to that mission, recently completed two back-to-back cryoproof tests at Massey's on the same day, a rare and aggressive testing schedule that shows growing confidence in the hardware. During the test, both the methane tanks were filled with liquid nitrogen to simulate cryogenic stresses, while hydraulic rams applied flight-like loads to the aft section. The test confirmed plumbing reliability and yielded valuable structural data on the ship's structural integrity under flight-like stresses. Engine installation for static fire will commence once the vehicle returns to the production site. The second launch pad has seen notable developments in recent days. After months of horizontal and vertical actuation tests, followed by water bag testing to evaluate load-bearing capacity and validate structural deflection, stress distribution, and joint deformation, the Pad B tower arms have now entered the operational testing phase. On Monday evening, for the first time, the arms performed a simulated catch test. The procedure began with raising the arms to the top of the tower. Once in position, the landing rail system was deployed, and the arms conducted mock rocket catch sequences. The data gathered from these kinds of tests will be crucial in fine-tuning both the software control systems and mechanical response characteristics of the arms. At ground level, work also continues on the launch mount infrastructure. Teams recently installed a protective hood over the propellant feed lines connected to one of the two booster quick disconnect mechanisms. This hood shields the plumbing from Super Heavy's exhaust plume during launch. Based on current hardware observations, Pad B will include one BQD each for the liquid methane and liquid oxygen supply to the booster stage. The graphic shown here illustrates how these hoods enclose and protect the BQD assemblies. More of these protective hoods and covers are expected to arrive and be installed eventually covering all exposed plumbing. In parallel, the launch mount itself is receiving a new set of water manifolds. These manifolds supply water into internal channels within the mount's top deck, where it's released at ignition and liftoff to absorb heat and dampen the intense acoustic energy generated by the engines. The latest manifold is currently being integrated with the manifolds pre-installed on the mount before its transport to the launch site. Meanwhile, Construction teams have begun drilling just outside the flame trench to install deep foundation piles. This work will support new concrete structures designed to handle the redirected exhaust flow after it exits the trench. Without this added protection, the sheer force and temperature of the plume could erode the surrounding terrain, especially with repeated launches. Elon Musk has unveiled major Starship updates during the latest company talk at Starbase, highlighting significant progress toward making life multiplanetary. Let's break down the newly revealed technical details that have never been publicly disclosed until now. The centerpiece of the presentation was the roadmap for next-generation Starship hardware. The upcoming Block 3 variant features a stretched super-heavy booster measuring 72.3 meters, paired with a 52.1-meter Starship upper stage. Future iterations aim to extend the booster to 81 meters and the ship to 61 meters, resulting in a full-stack height of 142 meters. In parallel with dimensional upgrades, propulsion improvements are underway. The Starship upper stage will gain three additional vacuum-optimized Raptor engines, increasing the full-stack engine count to 42. Musk also shared the first test footage of the Raptor 3 engine, which has completed over 300 firings and accumulated more than 16,000 seconds of runtime at SpaceX's McGregor facility. Another major enhancement is the shift to a fully integrated hot-stage ring displayed inside the Star Factory. Unlike the current expendable hot stage adapter, which is jettisoned post staging to reduce booster mass for tower landing, the new design is reusable. 
It employs a circular truss structure built from stainless steel triangular struts, providing high geometric stiffness and load-bearing efficiency while reducing mass. The configuration supports structural integrity during ascent and allows unobstructed engine plume exhaust during stage separation. Further structural optimization includes a reduction from four to three grid fins on the Super Heavy booster, cutting mass while improving aerodynamic control during descent and recovery. On the infrastructure front, Pad B is nearing readiness, with a Starship catch attempt using the launch tower arms expected within two to three months. Simultaneously, groundwork has begun for the new Gigabay facility, which is projected to enable production of up to 1,000 Starships annually. The former high bay has been fully demolished to clear space for this high-throughput manufacturing complex. Musk also outlined the in-space propellant transfer architecture, critical for enabling interplanetary missions. If orbital refueling is successful, SpaceX aims to launch five starships to Mars as early as late 2026, each carrying Tesla Optimus robots for initial site preparation. Starship traffic will increase in subsequent Mars windows. The first crewed mission is tentatively planned for 2028, although Musk suggested 2031 is a more realistic target. Arcadia Planitia is the prime candidate for the first Mars landing, owing to its shallow subsurface water ice, critical for in situ resource utilization, life support, and propellant production. Mars Earth Data Relay will be supported by a dedicated Starlink constellation. Overall, Musk's presentation unveiled, for the first time, the hardware and design strategies of the next-generation Starship and the mission architecture that will define SpaceX's path to Mars. You can watch the full, uncut presentation via the link in the description. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. China has successfully launched the Tianwen-2 mission, a bold step in planetary science aimed at retrieving surface samples from the near-Earth asteroid Kamualiwa. Let's break down the mission in detail. The spacecraft lifted off on May 28 aboard a Long March 3B rocket from the Zhichang Satellite Launch Center. Following a nominal ascent and precise stage separations, Tianwen-2 was deployed from the upper stage, unfolded its solar arrays, and entered a heliocentric transfer orbit toward its target. Kamuliwa is a quasi-satellite of Earth, a rare near-Earth object that orbits the Sun but stays in a relatively stable gravitational configuration with our planet. Estimated to be 40 to 100 meters in diameter, it completes one solar orbit every 366 days and spins rapidly with a 28-minute rotation period. Tianwen-2 will perform a series of trajectory corrections and gravity assists, aiming to enter a stable orbit around Kamualiwa by June 2026. Once in orbit, it will study the asteroid using 10 onboard instruments, including high-resolution cameras, spectrometers, and radar systems. These will map the surface, analyze the composition, and characterize the local environment to determine a safe landing site. Once a suitable landing site is selected, Tianwen-2 will deploy its lander to the surface of Kamualiwa. The lander is equipped with two distinct sample collection systems. The first is a touch-and-go mechanism, similar to those used by NASA's OSIRIS-REx and JAXA's Hayabusa-2 missions, which briefly contacts the surface using a robotic arm to collect regolith via gas bursts or mechanical scraping. The second is an anchor and attach system, where the lander performs a soft touchdown and uses drills embedded in its legs to anchor itself and dig into the surface to extract subsurface material. If successful, this will mark the first ever use of the anchor and attach technique on an asteroid. Together, these systems are designed to retrieve at least 100 grams of material. Following the collection, the lander will ascend and dock with the orbiter to transfer the samples into a return capsule. Tianwen-2 will then begin its return journey to Earth by April 2027. Six months later, in November, the spacecraft will arrive near Earth. The sample capsule will separate from the spacecraft, re-enter the atmosphere, and land in China's Gobi Desert, where it will be recovered for laboratory analysis. The samples will offer vital clues about the early solar system, potentially revealing the building blocks of terrestrial planets, the origin of water, and organic compounds that may have seeded life on Earth. Meanwhile, after delivering the asteroid samples to Earth, Tianwen-2 will perform an Earth gravity assist and head toward its second target, the main belt comet 311P, PANSTARS, with an arrival planned for January 2035. There, the spacecraft will conduct close-up investigations of the comet's dust emission, surface activity, and internal structure, helping to unravel the nature of main belt comets, and offering new insights into volatile transport mechanisms and the preservation of ice in the inner solar system. Tianwen-2 builds on the success of Tianwen-1, 
China's 2020 Mars mission, and is part of an increasingly ambitious roadmap. Tianwen-3, a Mars sample return mission, is set for 2028, followed by Tianwen-4 in 2030, which will explore Jupiter and its moons, marking China's first mission to the outer solar system. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.